Hello all of you lovely people, Jules here for Live and Let's Dice and I've got something pretty special for you today because even though the lockdown that's affecting the UK and everywhere else abroad is kicking our ass at the moment and meaning that we can't go down to like the local games emporium and play games like 40k and D&D with our friends and family as much as we'd like and we have to make do with just playing Cluedo or Monopoly or something with our family members and they drive us bloody insane. I do have some good news for you, because that is Resident Evil 3 The Board Game is coming, and I, thanks to a lovely sit-down chat and playthrough with Sherwin Matthews, the game's developer, well, I got to play it, and I've got my first impressions for you today. And in short, it's bloody brilliant. Now, here's the thing. I absolutely loved the Resident Evil 2 board game that they've done. I felt like it was a really, really honest adaptation of the source material and they developed such a fun, tense and fright-filled game that had so many brilliant twists that I could see myself playing it over and over again. So I did with a few friends and we went through the campaign with multiple different characters and even had a permadeath feature that when one of our characters died we'd have to switch in a new one and carry on playing that way. It was such good fun. And if you've not played it, I'll quickly break down what it was because the uh, main core elements for the Resident Evil 3 game are pretty much the same. It's a tile-based game, and this uh, Resident Evil 2 focused on the story that followed the Resident Evil 2 PS1 original uh, video game. And you basically uh, could move through, ha had your characters of, uh, split into two teams, and you were tasked with getting um, new items and key cards and unlocking stuff, basically progressing through the game, and you used dice to determine whether or not you evaded zombies or hit them when you were firing your bullets, and everything was resource management, and it was tense, and you had this lovely tension deck, which basically at the end of your turn you'd flip over and something good or more likely something terrible would happen that would affect you and the other players going forward. Now, the thing is, with Resident Evil 3, they could have just rested on their laurels. They could have basically just put out uh, what would effectively have just been an expansion with a Resi 3 skin over the top, but the amount of work that has gone into this game is insane. I got to sit down and play with Sherwin we went to Tabletopia and we played an online version of the game that I've uh, put some screenshots that I'll show for you guys in a bit. But I noticed immediately that the tone of the game had changed to fit something that was much more in keeping with Resident Evil 3 as a game. It's uh, much more action focused. Uh, the map tiles are a little bit smaller and that's meant that the zombies are much closer or other enemies as may well be the case were much closer to you and you'd have to obviously uh, figure out how to get around them with a limited movement space. But they also have made sure that the characters feel much more empowered and capable of dealing with this uh, more encroaching threat. For example, I got to play as Jill Valentine, and one of her two skills that she's got on her card means that when you roll a full circle when making an attack, you'll be able to reposition her, meaning that you'll be able to actually get closer to your goal and, or move away from the enemy if you know that it's going to be on your doorstep in your next turn. It's things like that that mean that you're constantly moving, constantly doing stuff. And if there's one criticism that could be leveled at the Resident Evil 2 board game, it's that your uh, starting points for your two parties often felt very uh, spaced apart and I feel that maybe the uh, design uh, of trying to keep the game uh, as honest uh, and as true to the original's map layout I feel may have come at its detriment in terms of the gameplay in some areas. I'm not saying that it was a bad thing, it was just that there were some uh, turns where you'd be like three turns solid running with nothing uh, in your way so you'd just be like okay I'm just I'm just my turn is literally just going to be moving here though there's always something or you're close to a door or a new room or uh, area to explore and there's new hazards as well to make sure that exploring these areas can sometimes be absolutely devastatingly brutal for example fire tokens are a big thing in this game and moving into it you'll take one point of damage it's not great when everything is out to kill you to take some more stuff off of environmental damage as well especially when you can roll a dice when you go into new areas areas that determines what enemies are going to be in there and sometimes a fire token will be in there and the spawn point will be right on a door meaning that you'll be taking damage no matter what you do. It's got the potential to be extremely, extremely brutal. The way that the story plays out isn't actually as fixed uh, a narrative as the uh, Resident Evil 2 was either, because in here what they're trying to do is make the game feel like uh, a more open world experience. Now I know that that sounds a bit strange having an open world board game, but it's been done really, really well. What happens is, is that when you're exploring, you'll pick up items, and some of these items will come uh, from a C deck, there's an A, B and C deck, and they'll be sort of key items that you need for your um, 
to uh, solve a puzzle or progress through the scenario, or they will unlock new scenarios for you to then go and play through. So for what, uh, the demo that I played, uh, I found a car battery and unlocked a part of downtown Raccoon City. Now what that meant is, is that after the entire scenario was done, we were able to go back to this board which tracks all of our progress and everything that we've collected. I was able to put that on there and say we can now go to that area because we have unlocked it. And that meant that um, when we, uh, if we wanted to go there to pick up supplies in order to come back to a level that we found very difficult, that was now a possibility. Now these scenarios sometimes they won't lead to uh, the next narrative step. They won't provide anything other than a plants uh, a chance to restock and resupply. But that's essential when you consider that in this game you will of course be going up against Nemesis, and Nemesis. Well, to put it bluntly, it kicked my ass. <laughs> it absolutely handed me, had me sent for my dinner. Now, the reason being is because in stage one, it had five health, was able to do a massive lurching attack for two damage that pushes you. And I encountered it at the very end, just outside of the RPD in the scenario that we played. And it meant that I'd used up most of my ammo anyway. I mean, admittedly, it didn't help that I had three shotgun rounds and I fired two of them, which you rolled two dice and it was it's meant to be quite easy to hit with a shotgun whiffed all of them whiffed all four shots fantastic good times but still that actually leads me on to my next point which is the ai for the uh enemies has been significantly tweaked uh, with a very slight change but it's had a huge impact on it now what happens is is that when you draw certain cards from a tension deck which is after every single player has their act sorry after you've had your actions you then do the enemy reactions as in they move or attack you then you draw from the tension deck and as i said before most of the cards in there are all clear nothing happens but sometimes something horrible will happen like spawn an enemy on the same point as you or uh this flock of crows will come and attack you and you you need to make a dodge roll or you need to do something else. They also have little icons below the standard text, which only triggers if the city threat level is at a certain point. Now, a city threat level in this game is that uh, every action you do, every choice that you make, every scenario that you complete will either have a positive or negative effect on the overall city threat rating. And if you played games like um, uh, Dead of Winter, or the Thunderbirds board game, you'll notice that they've got like that uh, threat meter at the top and when it fills up, then it's game over. Uh, and this is effectively the same thing and you can uh, do scenarios, mission objectives and make choices that positively or negatively affect that. And it will make it harder the further up that threat level rises. A good example would be, uh, there's uh, was a zombie card that we drew and I believe that the text on it said normally that uh, it would just spawn an enemy uh, on that uh, tile in front of you. Pretty bad to start with, but not the worst. But if your threat level was at a certain uh, height in amber, I think it was, then that zombie would then make an immediate attack against you. And it affects every card that you draw from the tension deck. So if you're at the very peak of that threat level, then uh, you are going to get absolutely creamed just by going through the regular tension deck. It's going to be brutally hard, as I said before. But it's not all bad news though, because the survivors obviously have been equipped with a bit more firepower and oomph to make sure that they can survive or last a little bit longer. For example, the shotgun that I was talking about earlier. In the Resident Evil 2 board game, every hit that you scored from that was just individually doled out to an enemy. Whereas in this, if you roll a hit with it, it will do that damage, that one point of damage per uh, successful shot, to each enemy on the tile because it's like a spread. Which means that you can group or kite enemies together and get a whole load of zombies, walk up towards them, and boom, take out all of them in one shot. It makes it feel like the balance of power isn't an equal, but instead you're running a razor's edge the entire time because yes it's great that you can now take out an entire tile full of zombies but at the same time well, what if you miss like i did <laughs> And I love the fact that the resources actually completely reset and change every time you come back to do a scenario, meaning that you'll never have the same thing in the same place twice. And it's that level of replayability that carries on into the scenarios themselves. There's 14 different scenarios, which is really insane because the amount of replayability you get from that is going to be absolutely tons and the fact that this uh, project has been kickstarted to high heaven means that there's going to be even more expansions being dropped with this when it finally comes out next year. It's 
It's gobsmacking how much attention to detail they've already paid to this, and the fact that they're addressing every single complaint that the previous game had in new and exciting ways. The tiles, for example, are much brighter so you can see what's going on. They've added in new threats and new ways to keep the enemies feeling less stagnant. I mean, like, there was nothing wrong with the way that the enemies were behaving before, but having this new sort of sub-level of AI within the tension deck is utterly brilliant because you've basically randomized uh, an AI for your uh, enemy without having to come up with a behaviour deck. It's really clever. And as I said before, the city tension adds in a brand new and terrifying gameplay element, because not only does it affect how screwed you might be when it comes to the regular enemies, but it affects the bosses as well. For example, Nemesis evolves the more that the city tension or city threat level has risen. So by the end of it, if you have messed up, he will mess you up. But easily the thing that I'm looking the most forward to is the narrative events that will pop up during the scenarios. So you remember when you were playing the PS1 game of Resident Evil 3 and you would meet Nemesis and it would give you that few seconds to make a choice of whether you wanted to fight him or run away and hide? Well this game does that as well, because when you encounter such moments, the game effectively pauses and gives you a choice. Do you want to complete the scenario by doing this or do you want to run away and do this but leave behind things that you've made which is slightly safer? but it does mean that you're going to have to come back. I love this approach and this flexibility because, let's face it, each time that you you do a run, it's not going to go well 100% of the time. Mistakes and ammo is going to be wasted. So of course you'll, you don't want to be in a situation where you spend nearly an hour, maybe an hour and a half, only to get to the final point and realise we can't win. It's impossible. You want people to leave the experience feeling happy, and this allows just that to happen, because now, even if you are getting your ass absolutely handed to you, you can just go, right guys, let's just bail for the moment, we've got some new items, I've got this, you've got that, let's go do another scenario and then come back to this one feeling stronger. Because you don't feel like it's a loss then, you don't feel like the game has beaten you, you just go, I'm not ready for it just yet, but just you wait when I come back. And if that wasn't enough customization for you, then these narrative events actually also pop up randomly throughout the game. Sometimes you'll come across a wounded survivor, sometimes you'll be asked if you want to do this or help this person out here, or even just stop zombies from coming through a door. It's little choices like that that might not immediately seem like it's going to be a huge thing, but they do pay off or don't pay off, as might be the case, much later down the line. Uh, Sean was telling me about this one example with these zombies. You might come across a door that has loads of moaning and groaning behind it. You might decide to yourself, I'm not going to go in there, that definitely seems like a bad choice. But by doing that, the game logs your decision and further down the line, if the city uh, threat level reaches a certain point or another condition is fulfilled, those zombies burst forward and immediately get spawned onto your map or wherever you are and will absolutely ruin your day. However, if you feel that instead you want to take on those zombies, you can do so, but it might come at the risk of your party. Either way, it's these little choices within a game about bigger choices, in a game that therefore has tons of cascading random events. So in essence, this is a game that finally delivers on that promise that so many others make of never being the same twice. I love the experience that I've had. I know that I'm going to love the full game, not only because of the fact that I enjoyed Resident Evil 2 so much, but because of the tweaks and the love that has been put in here. I am so, so psyched to get the full release of this, and I'll make sure to do a playthrough of it on Live and Let's Dice with me and the boys when all of this is finally over, so stay tuned for that. If you want to chat to me further, you can do so over on Twitter at RetroJ with a zero. But until then, stay safe, you absolute stars. Catch you there.